Welcome to St. Andrew Presbyterian Church of Tulsa, Oklahoma. We and I am so pleased that you have chosen and joined with us this morning and worship together and praise God together. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, especially Happy New Year 2021. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship our Almighty God as we receive this morning's prelude. Please join with me, call to worship this morning. God has given us work to do. God called each of us before we were even born. It was God who named us. It is God who claims us. The light of God's love shines in us. Let's shine God's love into all the world.
Please join with me, call to confession, silent prayer this morning. Let the power of the Spirit shape our prayers. Let us pray together. O oh God, you call us to follow Christ. We are at times hesitant, unsure of our direction, uncertain of our commitment, unwilling to count the cost. And yet you continue to call us out of bondage into freedom, out of death into life. Where we have resisted your call and claim upon us, we ask for forgiveness. Where we have taken a small step toward you, we ask for encouragement. And where we have seen a glimpse of the future, we ask you to lead the way. Assurance of God's pardon. The Lord is our shepherd, therefore we lack nothing. Let us walk with the Lord, knowing we are forgiven and free. Peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Peace be with you and happy 
And now a reading from Genesis, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. The gospel reading today is taken from Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Now in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And, and just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Reading from Mark 1, 9 through 11. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We get a lot of robocalls at our house on the landline. Uh, back before the election in November, it seemed to be constant. Uh, but more recently, it would be, uh, I'm completing a, a survey, just answer one question. And I'm hanging up. I don't like polls, I don't like surveys, but you know, they're important for people to find out what the public is thinking. Even Jesus, one day when he was with the disciples, said, um, well, what's the word on the street? What are, what are people saying about me? Who do people say that I am? So even Jesus wanted to know what, what was being said. What, what were people thinking about him? The Gospel according to Mark gives us the answer to that question in the baptism of Jesus. Among many other things, the baptism in Mark points to the identity of Jesus. Now, it was only known to Jesus because apparently only Jesus recognized what was happening, but we as readers of Mark we are let in on the secret of who this Jesus is. And in the baptism, there are three signs that, that point us to the identity of Jesus. First of all, it says that as Jesus came out of the waters, the heavens were ripped open. And secondly, the Holy Spirit came down like a dove to Jesus. And finally, there was a voice from heaven. This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. These three signs point us to the identity of Jesus. First of all, the heavens were, were ripped open. Now, I don't know about you, but I just always thought of just the sky being up there and the dove kind of floating down. But it is a very active verb. The, the heavens were ripped in two. Uh, imagine being in a, a tent and, and, and it's dark and all of a sudden the roof of the tent is ripped open and, and the sunlight pours in and you can see the heavens were ripped open and you could begin to see. In Isaiah 64, it talks about wishing for God to split open the heavens and come down to his people. So this 
renting of the heavens is a way of talking about God with us. Mark says this in a way that Matthew and Luke say in terms of Emmanuel, God himself is with us. And John, as we heard last week, talks about the word becoming human and moving into the neighborhood. So whether we're thinking about Emmanuel or God becoming flesh in Jesus Christ and and dwelling with us, we are thinking about the division, the separation that blocks us off from God is, is split in two and we can come to know God and to be with God. That same word reoccurs in Mark, in Mark chapter 15, verse 38. Jesus is dying on the cross. And as he dies, Mark says, the the curtain in the temple is split in two from top to bottom and the division between the holy of holies that represented the presence of God is opened up. And once again, we can be present with God. Jesus is Emmanuel. Jesus is the Word made flesh and dwelling with us. Jesus is the one who gave his life on the cross that that division can be overcome and we can be with God. That's the first sign. The second sign is as the heavens were opened up, the Holy Spirit came down, symbolized by a dove, to be with Jesus. It tells us that this is no ordinary human being who is being baptized. This is the servant of the Lord prophesied in the book of Isaiah. The Spirit will rest on the servant and and he will proclaim the, the good news of light to the Gentiles, salvation to the people of Israel. Jesus is that one. And finally, there is this voice from heaven that that speaks of Jesus being the Son of God, the Beloved, the one with whom God is well pleased. And again, Mark picks up that theme later on when the centurion seeing Jesus dying on the cross says, truly, this is the Son of God. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Son of God who has come to bring us back into fellowship with God, to overcome the division between humanity and God. Jesus is the one. And and we come to see that in Jesus' baptism. We come to know Jesus' identity in baptism. But you know, baptism is, is also for us. If we are followers of Jesus, we have been baptized into him. The Apostle Paul speaks of the meaning of baptism in many different ways. But in Galatians chapter 3, he says that now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. 
And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And then again in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 11. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. As Jesus' identity as the Son of God is made plain in his baptism, so our identity as followers of Jesus is shown in our baptism as well. If we have been baptized in Christ, we have put on Christ. Probably he was thinking of, of the baptism in which uh, converts to the Christian faith would be baptized, and as they came out of the water, they would be given a new white robe to symbolize their new life, to put on Christ. Now, Clothes can be put on and taken off and they can symbolize different things. So what they're really saying is not that we simply wear our faith. It is that we become our faith. As I was thinking about baptism, I happened to read an article in uh, the Duke University uh, Faith and Leadership blog uh, about a minister who had uh, been baptized at age eight. And the article was an interview with her and she talked about her ministry and how important it was that her ministry grew out of her baptism because she said she was a member of a Korean immigrant Pentecostal church in Chicago, and she was baptized in that church, and in the Pentecostal tradition, elders, uh, elderly members of the church would prophesy, and they said to her in her baptism, you will be in ministry. And she thought, that was kind of strange because that church did not ordain women. How did they expect her to fulfill that baptismal prophecy? She talked to her mother. Her mother was very active as a young adult leader in the church, but not ordained. And, and how could she be in ministry? Well, uh, it said later on that her family moved to Tulsa uh, and joined a black Pentecostal church, and, and she grew from there. But she still didn't think about what did it mean to, to be in ministry. In fact, I think she was going to, to uh, major in music in college. But her mother died of cancer very suddenly, and forced her to rethink her life. And she began to think again of that baptismal prophecy. She would be in ministry. Later on, she married, married an, an African-American man and has three multiracial sons. And, and I'm sure all of this experience has been used by God because now she is a pastor of a large church in Seattle, a church that identifies itself as multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-racial. And it seeks to reach out and appeal to all different kinds of people that in Christ we are one. There is no longer 
Jew nor Greek, there is no longer slave nor free, there is no longer male nor female, because in Christ we are all baptized into the body of Christ. I don't know about you, I certainly have not had that kind of experience. I met my wife when uh, both of our families joined the same Southern Presbyterian white church when we were in eighth grade. We knew each other for eight years when we got married. Very ordinary, very plain, no great experiences. And yet God has also used me in ministry and I believe God uses every single one of us who are baptized in Christ to be His people, to proclaim His love and to bring people together who are separated from God in Jesus Christ. You don't have to have a, a, an unusual, special kind of story. You simply need to know that as we are baptized, we are raised up into newness of life, says Paul, so that we may serve him. And however way that you can, and in whatever a group or people or talent you have, you and I are baptized into Christ Jesus, and you and I are called to serve as we can. Let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, as we read yet again of Christ's baptism, we are reminded of our own baptism. And of that call to serve, we are reminded of your promises of the Spirit that works with us and undergirds us and helps us find the words to use and gives us courage for these very difficult times. O oh Lord God, open to us your presence and your purpose for our lives. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
This ice bucket has been sitting here in the church for many years, and I finally noticed it. There is a little plaque here that says the ice bucket belonging to Mary Kay Earl was used at the first baptism at St. Andrews on April the 10th, 1955. Can't you imagine that there was someone to be baptized and they didn't have a baptismal bowl and so somebody went home and, and found an ice bucket and made do. God makes do, uses us wherever we are, with, with whatever we have, uh, with our gifts, our abilities, our, our skills. God uses us as God used an ice bucket for a baptismal font. Think about how God can be using you this year in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of the economic problems, how can God be using you as you go in service? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit will be with us this day and every day. Amen.